Welcome, welcome everybody. It is the second David Pakman Show Town Hall. We have producer Lewis in the uh, darkened version of the studio in Austin, Texas. We have um, Dennis the intern who is helping us out. So the process will be just like last time. If you have a webcam and microphone, you want to ask a question, you can request, I, I think the way it works is you can request to go on air and then you can tell Dennis what your question is and Dennis is going to do his best to kind of get everybody um, in, uh, in, in some kind of line, I guess. And then if you have only a microphone, you can also, I think you can still ask questions and then certainly if you don't have either, you can ask text questions. I think you also send those as requests to Dennis and then those will be put up on the screen. Um, so, yeah, that, that I think is going to be the, uh, the, the process. So, Dennis, you tell me, let me see, I need to, I need, we need to make sure that we have all of our uh, ducks in a row here, Lewis, um, because I now can't see when Dennis tells me we have a new question. I don't remember what button it is that I hit. Um, hmm. Where was that? There's something that says uh, waiting and reply next to Dennis, but I don't know. Yeah, that's for it's, sure. It's All right, well, Dennis, I think I think we might just be ready for the first uh, question, right, Lewis? I mean, why why delay this any further? We can uh, we can get going with the first question. Wait, All right, no, we, have we don't have a question. I was just Sam testing Miller. my microphone. So I far, was testing dark. My microphone. Oh, there we go. There's Sam. No. All right, I hey Sam, testing. how are you? What's what's your question? No, I was just testing my microphone. I didn't mean to get in here. Oh, you didn't? Okay, all right. Well, we will take Sam immediately off the air. How dare he? Um, that, is, that, is, that was insanity. Uh, okay, so Dennis, I, I don't remember exactly where it is. You know what, Dennis? Use the producer chat instead of sending messages directly, and that, um, that I think will be the, the, the best thing. Um, so yeah, Dennis, we'll just kind of keep talking. Dennis, when you're ready to go with the next question, let's by all means uh, get that going. Lewis, I think hopefully this time we will, I, I, I last time embarrassingly with about a minute to go, my laptop died because I was over um, estimating the, the battery life of my laptop. But I want to let everybody know, including you, Lewis, that I am fully plugged in for today. You mean you're not running on battery at all? You've used your, your adapter and you're plugged into the wall. That's exactly right. So let's go to the first question from Frank McAvoy. Who was the most difficult interviewee you encountered? Mm. You know, it depends on what you mean by, by difficult, right? I mean, sometimes difficult is like professional politicians are difficult because they're really good at just not answering questions. So in that sense, it's probably people like Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick, uh, former Massachusetts Senator and now Secretary of State John Kerry, because you're doing an interview. It seems like an interview is taking place. But really, they're just re repeating the talking points that they've decided they're going to be using. So in that sense, any professional politician is pretty difficult. Um, and then I would say that in terms of just being difficult to handle, probably the three-way debates we've had, like when we had Westboro Baptist Church with the former Navy chaplain Klingenschmidt on, or any of those where I kind of have to keep people under control and manage both that nobody gets too much or too little time to speak, but also that the interview has like kind of a narrative that makes sense to the audience. Those can be pretty difficult, I'd say, Lewis. I think I would put people like Orly Tates and uh, people from the Westboro <laughs> Baptist Church, mostly Shirley Phelps Roper, into the same category as some of these politicians because you'll ask them a question and they'll just kind of go on a rant. Uh, with Orly Tates, she was incredibly difficult, especially the first couple times we interviewed her because we would ask a question and then she would just talk for uh, you know, what seemed like five, five minutes um, about all sorts of things we didn't ask her about. Um, yeah, but, that's for sure. Yeah, so I guess the, that's the, the, the long and short of it. Uh, the other, I mean, the other thing about Orly Tates, th there's another thing that's really challenging, actually, and now that we've kind of changed how we do the interviews, it's a little bit less of an issue, but sometimes we have 10 minutes for an interview, right? We have 10 minutes allocated, and 
you might get a guest who is not really ready for a 10-minute interview. They're ready more for 10-minute answers to individual questions. And it's been six minutes before you even get an opportunity to ask question number two. Those can be really tough because you either have to just tell them you're, you're taking too long to answer or plan on just cutting stuff out of the interview later, which can be really difficult. We try to avoid doing that. So sometimes it's tough to manage Lewis in general when people just go on as if it's a two-hour interview instead of a 10-minute interview. And unfortunately, that also makes for a very dull interview. Um, and I, I didn't really want to have Orly Tate's back on the show, but Dave was kind of adamant about it. Um, but um, I, I try to avoid people like that. Yeah, um, uh, Lewis did not agree with the Orly Tate's interview. Okay, Dennis, I think we're ready for the next uh, question here. Maybe, maybe a video question upcoming. Video question upcoming. We do. Armosa is joining us. Dark so far. I can hear my own voice feeding back through her microphone. Let's see if she, if hey. you, maybe you don't have a webcam, but you can go ahead and ask a question. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, I think uh, you are in favor of euthanasia. You've sp spoken about this a lot of times on, on your show. But, uh, and you're very against the death penalty. I think um, I've, I've taken that. Um, what... Um, like, for example, if there there would be um, like a doctor assisted suicide, and there would be like a misjudgment of a patient because they are like a really terminal patient, um, wouldn't that lead to like involuntary in, involuntary euthanasia, which would actually cost to be the death penalty in in certain cases, or would you think it's like more of a black and white situation, where either it's involuntary okay. uh, or Right, yeah, yeah. This is an interesting question. Hermosa, I'm going to just take you off. Oh, let's see, I can just mute you for now because my own voice is feeding back, so I think that'll resolve it. Uh, okay, so, yes. Uh, I, I, my feelings about doctor-assisted suicide are less clear than that if someone has decided that they want to end their life, that certainly there should be some kind of system in place that would allow them to do that. Now, you're getting to an interesting point, right, which is some people may have come to the conclusion that they want to end their life because of a doctor's assessment of their physical condition. And that assessment could be wrong, and somebody might decide to end their life based on uh, incorrect information about their prognosis. Um, at the same time, if people feel that they are at a quality of life that regardless of the prognosis, they feel that it is not okay with them to continue, then it would still be what I guess we could call an informed decision in the sense that regardless of the, of the prognosis, they're feeling a certain level of pain, discomfort, or otherwise have decided that, that uh, they, they need to end their life. So, um, I, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm getting at what you're saying, uh, what you're asking exactly. I'll, let me raise your microphone here so we can um, hear you again, although that, that seems to not be working. I'll say, here we go. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so you definitely answered my question, and I really appreciate it. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, Louis, do you, do you want to add something to this? Uh, it's a very, it's, a, it's a, certainly a good question, although for me, it doesn't have that much to do with this kind of involuntary death penalty type of thing because it's so drastically different in its nuts and bolts. Well, I think, I think that I, I would include people who just have a very bad quality of life in the category of people who should, be, should qualify for assisted suicide, maybe doctor-assisted suicide, which will probably be the only way it could be done. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily mean a, a terminal illness. It just means that uh, you could have like you said, a very bad quality of life. And I think those people would qualify too. And I'm sure that if it became legal across the country, there would be countless cases where there's all sorts of legal problems and, uh, and family members getting involved who are upset. And um, uh, it would be, it could be a mess, but I, I still support it. And I, I would just assume that everything would go well and according to plan. Do you think, or, or why do you think it is, Lewis, that as many doctors that you and I know personally have not voted in favor 
of doctor-assisted suicide bills when they've come up for ballots? I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Maybe there's just something about uh, their, their Hippocratic Oath and everything they're taught uh, that makes them think that this is just uh, not acceptable. Uh, I, I don't know. I, maybe there are different, uh, different answers for it from different doctors, but it's, it's very confusing it, to me. Be, I wonder if, if it could be, uh, I wonder if it could be concern over counseling someone in a way that they may later regret in some way, right? I mean, I think it would be an interesting question to put to if we, we in fact, this could be a good interview to have a doctor who is in favor of doctor-assisted suicide and one who is against. Ideally, it would not be one who is against simply for religious or kind of pie-in-the-sky moral reasons, but who, who is against it for some kind of more practical reason. I think that could be a really interesting interview, actually. Certainly, if, if uh, there is anyone in the audience who knows people who uh, might, might fit the bill for an interview like that or perhaps a debate, let us know. Okay, so to remind everybody, we're here at the uh, September 2nd Members Only Town Hall. There are basically three ways to ask questions. Number one is you can submit text questions. You can ask a question. Uh, you can also, if you can't figure out where that button is, you can send one directly to Dennis West, who's listed as a producer on the uh, town hall. If you have a microphone but no camera, you can ask to be put on the air. And as was the case with Hermosa, we can hear you, but we won't be able to see you. And then lastly, if you have a, a webcam with a microphone, you can ask to be put on the air, and Dennis can coordinate that, and then you will be able to ask uh, a, uh, a question with audio and video, which is, of course, the wonder of the Internet, Lewis. So, Dennis, give us the next question, be it text, audio, or video. I think we're ready for it. Hello. All right. We have Srinath. Srinath, what's your question? So... I would like to know um, how Natan is doing and how he's been um, keeping up with the show and everything, if he has. Okay, very, very good question. All right, so uh, as we mentioned, Natan, former TV director Natan, for new members, my little brother, used to be the TV director, as I mentioned, uh, and he left to go be the TV director at the Stephanie Miller program in Los Angeles. And this was, um, someone came to me and said, you know, we need someone who's looking to do A, B, and C. Do you know anyone with those skills? And of course, it was exactly what Natan had done on our show, Lewis, as you very well know. So I knew that we were going to New York City. Natan was not necessarily committed to going to New York City. So I said, you know, let's run it by Natan and see if it's something he wants to do. Uh, lo and behold, he did want to do that. So he went out to uh, Los Angeles. He was there something like seven or eight months. He set up the Stephanie Miller TV program, and that all went great. And that project recently came to a close. And I've mentioned on the broadcast program a couple of times, Natan's next project is he is going to be going to graduate school in Tel Aviv in Israel. He will be getting a master's degree there in some, I don't remember exactly what the name of the uh, uh, degree is, but it's some kind of international relations uh, type of thing. So he's actually going, Lewis, it's actually three weeks from, uh, from this week. I don't remember the exact day. Uh, so I think that'll be very, very interesting. He's only going to be there for about a year. He may at some point use the skills he learns to come back to the media world. He may go in a world of advocacy or, or maybe think tank, but I think it's going to be a pretty interesting year, Lewis, and hopefully we can get him to uh, do a little reporting for us while he's there. That would be ideal. Certainly, there's a lot of things happening in Israel. Uh, I hope uh, I hope he has a safe stay. Um, I've talked with him very briefly about what's been going on, but I, I would be very curious to hear what he has to say about uh, life in, in Israel at the moment. Yeah, so maybe in something like you know mid-October or something like that, we could hear from, from Natan and see kind of what's going on there. And he certainly will have access to Skype. So hopefully Natan will be making his return. So very, very good question. Thank you for that one. Uh, I'm told we already have another question coming up. So, Dennis, uh, uh, fire away. It's a text question. Okay, Blake, w Blake wants to know, are you excited about the game Destiny coming out next week? I can only assume this question is for Lewis. Lewis, let's start with the very beginning. What is Destiny? Uh, you're not going to like my answer. I I've heard of it. I haven't looked into it at all. I don't know anything about this game. 
Uh, I know that I have some friends who are very interested in it. Uh, that's that's all I know. Um, it, there's there's a lot of hype around it, I guess, but uh, I can't say I'm excited because I don't know anything about it. Would you say, Lewis, that at this point you're successful breaking the habit, as the case were, of video game addiction has made it so you're not even really tuned in to what's going on in the video game world? No, I wouldn't say that. There there are still some games that uh, I have anticipated and and played and s still plenty of games on my list that I want to play. I just, uh, I guess I'm not as involved as I used to be, but um, I'm still a gamer and I still... I still partake uh, pretty often. Yeah, all right, that's interesting. Lewis, I, I actually meant to ask you one thing, which was uh, I recently saw, do you remember the game Descent that we used to play when we were probably like early teens? That was uh, an interesting game. It was one of those first, uh, it was kind of the first game of that style. Uh, it was nauseating, to say the least. It was, uh, I didn't play it too often because staring at that screen and everything flipping around, uh, it just kind of made me sick. Well, anyway, my question was whether... I saw that there's a new version of this now. And uh, I, I saw it when I was looking on Steam. And it crossed my mind to maybe buy this game. Is this a game you would recommend or would not? Uh, Destiny? Which, which game? No, 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 no. The new, ver the new version of Descent. Oh, right, right. I, I, there's another one. Sorry, I don't know anything about it. Uh, you'd have to... Right. You'd have to go check out some reviews, unfortunately. Sorry, bad answer. All right, very good. Okay, Dennis, give us the next question. We're ready. David Wasserman's question is, the midterm elections full stop. Well, I, is, I'm not sure I know what exactly the question is. Is it just, what, if, what, about, <laughs> what about the midterm elections? What do we think about them? What do you, what do you think this question is, Lewis? I I would just guess broadly your thoughts on, on the midterm elections. Okay, well, uh, I think they're definitely going to happen, more than likely in early November. I think it is uh, unclear still what is going to happen in the Senate. Uh, some commentators, like our buddy Bill Scher, have suggested that there is a path for Democrats to take over the House I see it as an incredibly unlikely path, and I think even Bill admits that. Bill often presents very, very um, bleeding heart liberal ideas that sometimes can detach from reality, and he admits that, and, and we say that to him. And I think even he recognizes that it would be very unlikely for Democrats to take over the House. I think there's less question about what's going to happen in, in terms of uh, the election per se. But what's going to happen the last two years of President Obama's second term? Don't you think, Lewis, will the obstructionism continue? Will anything be done? Will Republicans actually do anything? I'm sure there will still be plenty of obstructionism. I, I, it's hard to say. Uh, I'm curious to see what happens with uh, some of the more fringe candidates in the midterm elections, which Tea Partiers will win, which, which completely crazy people will win. Um, but... Um, Certainly, I, I predict that there will still be plenty of Republicans doing absolutely nothing for, for another two years. Will you be voting in the midterms, Lewis? And I know we're opening up a huge can of worms, but it, are, are these elections that you will be voting in in Texas? It seems Texas is really a place, particularly for the state elections, where, where liberal votes can make a difference. You know, I actually have not registered. Uh, currently, I'm unable to vote in Texas. I have not registered yet. Oh, no. but. Yeah, you're going to have to get on my back about that one, Dave. A lot of people here know that uh, I, I tend to drop the ball on uh, when it comes to uh, you know, voting time. Well, if you don't vote in Texas, presumably you'll, you'll vote absentee in Massachusetts. But it would be great, I think, if we could get you switched over to Texas. I think you could have more of an impact there. You'd probably be a little bit more important in, in Texas. No question about it. All right, Dennis, let's uh, go, to, go to the next question. All right, we have John Greenlee joining us. I don't know if John has video. John, if you have audio, certainly please proceed. Hmm. Oh, there, there's John. John, I don't know. We, we can certainly see you, but I don't think that we can hear you. I think there may be some kind of problem with the audio. Um, we do have a video adjustment taking place. 
Yeah, John, I think your microphone is just off because we're not even getting background noise or anything. So let me, let me take John off the air temporarily so he can test his uh, equipment there. Um, and then we can, we can get back to him. Dennis, if you, have a, if you have a text question already lined up, feel free to put it up. Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, Rob Puff, do you ever get recognized in public? How would it feel if a fan of the show came up and introduced themselves while, while you were out in public? This has happened actually to Lewis quite a bit because he's basically on stage where he worked in Austin, Texas. Um, it, yeah, it has happened to me. In fact, just recently in New York City, I got home from being out and I had a tweet from someone saying, I think I just walked by you on Fifth Avenue. And case in point, I had been on Fifth Avenue um, very shortly before. Uh, but the person didn't actually come up to me. But yeah, it happens. I was in a restaurant the other day and somebody came up to me. It happens maybe once a month or something like that. Um, and it's, uh, it's always very nice unless it, I pick up on the, the, uh, something odd about the interaction and I, I'm, I start wondering if this may be a stalker or one of the people that we've had to contact the FBI about. Uh, but that's only like a handful of people, Lewis. So usually it's uh, a positive experience. Um, certainly a few times back home, I was, uh, I was recognized, but that's a little bit different, I would say, because the program is more, uh, available back in the town we were from. It was just, uh, I, I think people had easier access to it we were people were more likely to see it. Um, uh, I would have been recognized two or three times in Austin, but every time the person said, I know you, I know, I know you from somewhere. Where is it? Um, so they didn't know immediately but i humored them and i told them and uh they just i don't think any of none of them had any idea that i even now lived in texas uh and it's there it's was nice a, yeah, yeah. Show. yeah so so all, all the interactions have been positive there was one very interesting incident where i was in denver at a media conference and i was coming in the elevator and a guy gets in and he says I know you from somewhere. And, you know, I said, I don't know, maybe you, since it was a media conference, I assumed he was part of the conference and, and recognized me from the show. And he did, in fact, recognize me for the show. And I said, oh, so you're here for the conference. And he said, what conference? And I said, oh, there's this big conference. And he said, no, I'm here because my spiritual leader is holding a retreat in this hotel. Uh, and I said, oh, okay, well, just a coincidence, I guess. Yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting one. Um, you, you have been recognized many more times than I have, uh, I think, overall. All right, Dennis, I think we are ready for the next question. Hi, guys. Okay, we I have Sam have Miller now. on. Sam, let us know if you want to keep testing your audio and video, or uh, if you have a question, by all means. No, no, I actually, I actually have a question. Okay. Okay. Also, I'm wearing my David Pakman shirt. Um, nice. But my question, my question is... Um, I actually found the show through the Young Turks, and I was wondering how that whole affiliation, how did that come to be? Like, how did you first meet them and stuff? Right. Okay, this is a good question. So I'll, I'll mute Sam for now so we don't get feedback. I first met Cenk Uger, host and co-creator of the Young Turks, in 2010 or something like that at a radio conference that neither he nor I attend any longer because we both, I think, recognized that commercial radio was not the... Uh, bread and butter of what we were trying to achieve pretty quickly. And we talked a little bit. We weren't even on YouTube at the time, and he suggested that I look at making a YouTube channel and said there could be a future in online video, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, as people know, we did that, and the YouTube channel and the video component became way bigger than what was just a radio and podcast uh, program back then. Uh, and then I just kind of kept in touch with Jenk, and at a certain point, Lewis, I remember telling you about it, we, I, I kept telling the Young Turks, oh, we're interested in doing something more extensive with you guys. And eventually they said, hey, we have this model where we are um, going to be bringing on, we're going to create a network essentially, and we're, we want to bring you on. We were the first uh, TYT partner channel, and shortly thereafter, I think it was Sam Cedar who joined, a uh, former Massachusetts native, I should mention, Sam Cedar from Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, that was kind of it. So then we became TYT Network partners. I mean, Lewis, that is, am I missing anything in the story? I would say that between the time you met Jank and the time we became part of the TYT network, we did have him on the show uh, a few times. We interviewed him. And so uh, that's, that's kind of an important detail, too. 
That's right. In fact, we interviewed Jenk. We interviewed Anna Kasparian from the Young Turks. We interviewed uh, Ben Mankiewicz from the Young Turks, Michael Shore. So we had, we certainly had quite a relationship with them. So Sam, is, is that an appropriate answer? Yeah, that is. Thank you. You completely answered right. my question. Good. All right. See ya. I, I try, Lewis. Lewis, I don't want to uh, evade uh, questions, right? So if, if, if I am able to, I try to just answer these questions as directly as I can. So I think, Dennis, do we want to try John again and see if he has... Oh, no, we'll, we'll go... We have a text question. Okay. Uh, David's clairvoyance regarding South American small plane crash carrying politicians just after discussing similar crashes on the show before vacation. Lewis, I'm not sure I know what this is about. Was there a plane crash in South America during our recent vacation? If there was, we're, we're in the same boat. This must have been one of those stories that we missed. Uh, but I would say that there are small plane crashes all the time. Uh, but it is kind of eerie, of course, uh, that, that, that we're talking about uh, politicians in plane crashes. And then this happens immediately after. Um, kind of strange, but I don't know the details about this one. Yeah, uh, maybe, can we get John on audio and video and see if he can just explain what he's, what he's talking about? Hello. <clears throat> Let's see, there's John. Can you hear okay, me? Okay, John, we can hear you. What? Yeah, we can hear uh, you. just after you guys discussed this and went on vacation, there was, I think it was even Argentina, there was a small plane crash carrying politicians, and I thought, what the heck? It was just a bizarre situation. I thought, I didn't know if you would have heard of it or not. Let me see here. I'm going to look this up. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I'm not seeing anything about it. But, John, thank you for the question. I, I don't claim by any means to have predicted anything. I, I, I don't even know uh, what we had discussed. I mean, I think I said that planes were safer than ever before vacation, didn't I, well, Lewis? We were discussing uh, the, the plane crash uh, that killed um, Ted Stevens. Um, and and similar crashes and uh, and then of course right after that we went on vacation and uh, yeah it's, it's it's strange definitely yeah yeah no that, that we did definitely discuss that so that was uh, that was interesting okay so John I, I hope that that was your question if you meant to ask a different question via audio and video just let Dennis know and then and we can put that on um, okay so Dennis I think we're ready for whatever the next thing is if you have something uh, queued up okay uh, I am the Coltrane. I'm not sure what, the, what, the, what the, the name of this person is. Why do you think fear mongers and gold pumpers like Peter Schiff and Jim Rogers continue to be able to get airtime on networks like CNBC and Fox Business? Well, there's two possible answers. Uh, number one, they are directly or indirectly connected to uh, an organization or company that is an advertiser or otherwise funding those channels. Um, number two could just be that the producers still see gold as the type of thing that should be kind of pumped with very little pushback, which of course we don't, Lewis. We've been pushing back against the gold scammers for a really, really long time. Um, it is interesting. You, you would think at this point uh, networks would have realized that it's downright irresponsible to allow unchallenged gold pumpers to just go on there and talk about buying particularly these collectible coins, which you're buying at a highly inflated price relative to the, 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 the value of the gold itself. And it's so funny to me because oftentimes these gold mongers pitch the idea of gold as something in case it's a total economic collapse. And at the same time, they suggest buying collectible coins which in the event of an economic collapse would be worth only their weight in gold, not the premium that is there as a collectible coin. So it doesn't even make sense for the nightmare scenarios that are used to fear monk. Um, there are, right, that makes sense. There are certainly, there are ways to, to sell gold legitimately. And there are people in, in this country who do. But when there's some laziness here, because when these networks want to get someone on on this topic on air, who do you go to? You go to guys like this because they're well known and it's it's just easy. And I guess because they have successful businesses and they have a lot of money, um, they're the ones that uh, that you want to have on your program. Uh, so it's 
that maybe is why. But uh, of course, I guess having lots of money makes you legitimate when you're dealing with networks who also have lots of money. Yeah, I, I have no problem having those guys on, but we try to make pretty clear before that, um, let, me, let me put it a different way. We don't say anything that would suggest it's going to be an interview where we're just going along with the fear mongering and gold pumping. That, that's for sure. Sometimes, as has happened before, they're surprised when we have a position that's drastically different from theirs. But that I still maintain, Lewis, and I think you agree, if the guest doesn't do any research on the program, that, that's more their responsibility, I think. I, yeah, I think a, a 30 second Google search would yield all, all the information they need about this program. So that would, of course, fall on them. All right, Dennis, if you have another question, we're ready for the next one. Nate, Texas. Okay, are you on board with the Wolf Pack? Okay, we, we have addressed this before. I'm completely in favor of getting money out of politics. We've talked about how money is one of, if not the most corrupting influence in politics, period. Um, I've also been asked if I'm a member of Wolf Pack, and if you are, Lewis. Uh, neither of us are. We answered that recently on the regular show. I, I'm not really a member of anything. And uh, so I certainly support, of course, the ideas of what Wolfpack is doing. And um, uh, we actually, when we were uh, recently, when I was in Detroit for Netroots Nation, I had dinner with, among some other people, the director of Wolfpack. Uh, so we're very key keyed into what they're doing, but I'm not a member of Wolfpack. So that, uh, uh, I, I'm just not a member. So that's that. Lewis, anything you want to add to this? No, I'm not a member either. Like David, I'm not a, really a member of anything. It's it's an interesting idea. I, I support it. There are lots of ideas on how to get money out of politics. Some people think that this one is a terrible idea. Uh, but given the options, uh, I mean, it, it seems like one of the better ones. All right, Dennis, give us the next question. Frank McAvoy, I think that having Hillary Clinton run against Jeb Bush is a contest between two unsatisfactory candidates. Think NAFTA versus the Iraq wars. Do you think Bernie Sanders might try a run? I saw him in May and wanted to suggest it. Well, a lot of people have been suggesting this to Bernie Sanders. And in fact, the late, great Tim Carpenter, the great Massachusetts activist who was the director of Progressive Democrats for America, who recently passed away, sadly, as I discussed on the program, he collected or was involved in collecting, I don't remember if it was 10,000 or so signatures uh, urging Bernie Sanders to run. I would love to see someone like Bernie Sanders run, maybe with Elizabeth Warren or someone like that. I agree that Hillary Clinton is, is not, uh, is certainly not Elizabeth Warren, um, and certainly uh, not on the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. It's interesting because when I think of Democrats, Hillary Clinton is not that appealing to me. When I think of if a Republican has to be elected, Jeb Bush is actually one of the guys, along with John Huntsman, who I would say maybe that wouldn't be quite so bad, although certainly I don't want another Bush in office at all. If Yeah, if you look at all the Republican options, I guess Jeb Bush wouldn't be too bad, but of course we don't want a Republican in office at all. And uh, Hillary Clinton wouldn't be too different from a Republican. Uh, so, yes, I do think Bernie Sanders is, is, is one of the better options, and Elizabeth Warren would be a great option, even though I think because of her, her past it would be very difficult um, to win. Uh, I, I just, unfortunately, I don't really think that, that they have a shot. Hillary Clinton is probably the most qualified person ever to run for the presidency, which she hasn't even announced yet. Lewis, some Republicans when President Obama was first elected, said that in spite of the fact that they don't believe, uh, they don't agree with any of his policies, said they recognize and respect the importance of an African American becoming president of the United States. Do you think that there are individuals, could be Republicans, could be Democrats, doesn't really matter, who may not like Hillary Clinton's politics, either because she's too liberal or not liberal enough, depending on who we're talking about, who would still be supportive because they, they would recognize the significance of the first female president? I think it would be a, a great symbolic uh, move 
maybe not move, may a moment. It, it would be it would be important, but I, I don't know. I, I I think it's it's tricky. Certainly, a lot of women want to vote for Hillary just because she's a woman. Certainly, a lot of men don't want to vote for Hillary because she's a woman. Um, it's I don't think it's I, I may catch a lot of heat for this. Uh, I don't think it would be as important, uh, as symbolically important as Barack Obama becoming president, not just because he's black, but because he's black and his name was Barack Hussein Obama. I think that was huge, but it, it would still be, of course, uh, a nice, a nice moment if we had a, a female president. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, in thinking about the history of this country, it's true that at one point African Americans were slaves and they also were not um, even considered a, a whole person. At the same time, while women were never slaves, they were not allowed to vote and there's no question that they were certainly second class citizens. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think, I think that there would be a lot of reasonable people could disagree about whether African American versus female president, are they, which one is more, are they equally significant? Um, uh, probably a conversation that we'll, we'll, have, we'll be had. Dennis, I think we are ready for the next question. Rob Huff, what other media outlets do you guys read or watch? All right, Lewis, do you want to go first here? Uh, media outlets. Well, most of what I do is just uh, online stuff. So I'll go to uh, a number of different websites um, and, and, and read things like um, a lot of it is in, in preparation for the show. Of course, uh, we have things on both sides, right? We'll do Huffington Post, we'll do Drudge Report, we'll do uh, things like uh, The Verge, Gizmodo sometimes, tech stories and things like that. Uh, I'm a big fan of Vice, huge fan of Vice, and although I don't have, uh, I don't really have cable or HBO or anything like that, so I catch that stuff online when I can. Um, but I would say that Vice is probably the only larger uh, media outlet that I really focus on, and the rest really is just reading articles here and there, kind of all over the place. Well, I'll just give people the. I have a, we have a list of sources. This is now. This is for the show. In a second, I'll tell you the stuff I look at personally. So this is some of the stuff we look at for the show: Alternet, Brad Blog, Crooks and Liars, uh, Huffington Post, Mother Jones, Slate, Talking Points Memo, Think Progress, Truth Out, Truth Wins Out dot org, Wonket. Um, I also look at Drudge Report, Hot Air, and The Daily Caller on the right, and then we have a whole bunch of other websites, right? I mean, there's Cracked, Gawker, uh, Raw Story, Salon, ScienceNews.org, The Daily Beast, uh, Vice is on the list. And then personally, I'm kind of all over the place. I, I look at everything from uh, Medium, I don't know if you've heard of Medium, to the Utney Reader, U-T-N-E, to Philosopher's Mail. Um, all sorts of stuff. I, I don't have that list in front of me, actually, but that might be an interesting list to some people, uh, the stuff that I'm looking at. And in fact, let me, let me see if I can quickly pull it up, some of the stuff that I've been reading just kind of in my uh, spare time. So I mentioned... One that I visit frequently, sorry, BBC. That? BBC does a great job as well. Right. Uh, Brainpickings.org. PRI.org has a lot of good stuff. The Atlantic, The New Yorker, The Diplomat is very, very good for foreign policy type stuff if you want to follow up on that. Uh, NationalPost.com is very good. So yeah, lots of stuff there. Um, hopefully that's uh, some ideas at least for people. Okay, Dennis, I think we're ready for the next question. Blake, do you think we'd be better off having a North and South America? I'm not sure if this is a, uh, a satirical question, but as far as I know, we do have North and South America. Or, or does that mean a North and South United States, Lewis? Is that maybe what the question means? I think that's probably the question. A North, a North United States and a South United States, two separate countries. Uh, yeah, well, you can tackle that one first. Yeah, uh, there, so we've talked about this a little bit. The interesting thing about if we don't have to necessarily say north and south, right, because we have states in the west that are liberal and there are, uh, it's a little bit more mixed than that, but thinking of the idea of two Americas, 
If we were to split up in terms of blue states and red states, however it was kind of roughly divided, the red states would not be able to survive financially. As we've talked about, Lewis, the blue states pay in much more to the federal system than they get out, whereas the red states get way more than they put in. So the blue states are essentially subsidizing the red states. So should it happen? I don't know. I mean, I, as people on the show know, I get very, very disgusted and annoyed with the fact that these retrograde extremist elements of the country are part of this country. It really feels like they should that they should be probably in their own country because they're so drastically different. Um, but I, I don't know overall whether it would be a positive or negative thing to say we, we now have uh, you know the United States of the North and the United States of the South for, for lack of a better term. I I think that let's say let's just say the North was blue and the South was red and you could just you know draw it across the Mason Dixon line the South would it would become a third world country those red states that collectively would just uh, it would be a total disaster and the blue ones would prosper um, and to be honest I wish we could do that I really wish we could and I, I guess I'd have to move out of Texas but um, certainly it would improve the quality of life. For everyone significantly in those blue states uh, and I think a lot of the people in the red states would would be willing to see this experiment through uh, I just don't think they would like the results yeah no I agree with you I think they wouldn't and we also have to remember aside from state policy is the federal government a liberalizing or conservativeizing influence on the country if you think that it is a liberalizing influence, if you remove that and allow this new United States of the South or whatever to create their own federal government, if they want one, right? Maybe they just say, we don't need that at all. We're just states. Uh, that's going to even further push these states to the right, aside from the financial problems that they're going to have. So it's an interesting idea. I think it would be completely unviable financially. Dennis, I think we're ready for the next question. Kimberly Hughes, where do you guys envision yourself in 10 years' time? Wow, you know, I, I don't really think that far ahead, Lewis. I think mostly in terms of six months, one month, uh, one year, rather, and a few years, because things change so quickly, life changes so quickly. Uh, I, I don't know that I think that far ahead. Sometimes I like to think that far ahead. Maybe it's not... Uh, yeah thinking maybe it's just daydreaming and i like to think i'll be on, on a beach in in belize or costa rica somewhere but uh that's tough that's really tough i never thought i'd be in texas uh, two years ago certainly no way uh but here i am i would like to uh i don't know where i'd like to be but i know that i probably don't want to have any neighbors that's uh i can say that with certitude so wherever i am i'd like there to be some space around me where I don't have to deal with neighbors and, and noise and and crap but what does that mean like how you're saying you just want a house with a yard or you want even more of a buffer from other people um, I'm not saying I want to be in, in the wilderness of, of Montana I've just uh, you know just in a different situation um, living situation not that I'm unhappy with my current one but you know I would like to have a, a nice piece of land that's what I would like in 10 years. All right. That's interesting. Yeah, no, I, I, I think in 10 years I see myself definitely living in a city. That, that I, I can say with some level of certitude. So as far as that goes, I think. I mean, the other interesting thing, Lewis, is, or no, go ahead, yeah. What about where you see the show in 10 years? Do you think about that? Well, I think that the way media is changing, in 10 years, this program could be completely unrecognizable compared to what it is today. I mean, the, 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 the speed, the increasing speed at which the consumption of media is changing, who knows what it, what it could be in 10 years. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. I, it's, it's hard to say. Um, and that's something I, I don't really think about, to be honest. I just kind of uh, deal with it on a day-to-day on a -day basis. All right, Dennis, I think we're ready for the next question. I am the Coltrane. If you had the chance, would you interview Michael Savage? Out of all the major conservative talk show hosts, he seems like the most eccentric out of the bunch. Oh, any time that Michael Savage wants to be on the program, 
um, I would like to have him on. And I actually, I was told in confidence a story about Michael Savage involving, um, uh, what can we, involving his, his personal life, I guess, in a way that's connected to his work life. I, I, I don't even know how to explain this. That I would do everything under my power to have come out during that hypothetical interview because it is just so insane that I think it would be of, of uh, significant interest to the entire country if this topic were to uh, uh, be let loose, as the case, if, the, if the cat were to be let out of the bag. Um, so yes, Michael Savage, I would absolutely want to interview. I would want to interview Rush as well, or Sean Hannity, or Bill O'Reilly. I mean, I think all those guys, Glenn Beck, would make interesting interviews. They would, and they are all probably people that will never appear on this program. Uh, we used to play a lot of clips from Michael Savage, and he just kind of fell off the radar. I'm not sure if his popularity tanked or, or what, but uh, we just don't really hear anything about him anymore, and that's probably for the better. Yeah, very well, maybe. Uh, okay, let's see the next question. Sean McGuire, have you ever considered teaming up with other programs and perhaps offering discounts for other podcasts like Best of the Left or Jimmy Dore? Yeah, this has been discussed a little bit. Uh, there are some logistical challenges. There are a few other issues. Um, I, my hesitation, to be honest, is I worry. I, I worry a lot about branding because I assume that anyone who watches our show or listens to our show will not agree with me on every issue, and we see that all the time. That's fine, but I would worry that. If we were to team up in some kind of very official way where there's finances involved, right, where someone's paying 10 bucks a month for two memberships instead of six for each, for example, or something like that, that we would become in some way kind of liable uh, in this kind of uh, abstract sense for the political views of the other programs, even though, of course, they're produced completely independently and they're, they're free to say whatever they want, we're free to say whatever we want, I would worry that someone might not want to support our program because of the view that the other show holds, or something like that. You know, so that would kind of be my hesitation, Lewis. I, I think, I think our members would uh, would understand and appreciate differences of opinion between different programs. Uh, certainly, it could it could help the program significantly, but um, but it can be it can be complicated. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's about being completely independent. It's a very nice thing to be completely independent and not have, not have any ties and, uh, and connections like that. But uh, it's just something. to be clear, Lewis, people, people may think that because we're part of the Young Turks Network on YouTube that we're in some way not independent. So let me just put that out there for the people who are joining us here. Our connection to the Young Turks is merely in terms of cross-promotion. We're part of this broader network. Our memberships are completely separate. Our finances are completely separate, and we have no editorial connection to them whatsoever. There is no one at the Young Turks who is would would be in a position to suggest editorially what we should do. Nor has anyone ever tried. So I think it's important to clarify that. Yes, thank you for for clarifying that, and that's what I mean when I say we're completely independent. We are completely independent. Thank you for allowing me to clarify that, Lewis. All right, Dennis, let's see the next question. Dan Fierce. Dan is involved here. <laughs> David, if you were king of the USA, <laughs> what single issue would you tackle? Immigration reform, clean energy, progressive tax scheme, education, universal health care, and what would you do about it? Well, Lewis, I think as you and I have discussed many times before, um, almost every issue is connected to media coverage of that issue and financing around elections candidates and lobbying for that issue. So I think that if you want to tackle all of those issues, like let's say immigration and energy and progressive taxation and education, if you want to tackle all those things, the best way to get towards honest debate about it is to address the money, right? Because the money is what's funding the media coverage and the money is what's funding the lobbyists. And as we saw today with Eric Cantor, taking a $2 million a year salary, incredible, I mean, it's just amazing, after being defeated by Dave Bratt in the Virginia Republican primary, 
uh, the system is completely corrupt. So, so from my point of view, is if you tackle my, my main thing would be let's figure out why corporate media coverage is so corrupt and why the system is so corrupt and really it's money and then you can address any issue you want. Uh, yeah, the number one issue for me would be campaign campaign finance reform, coupled with um, I, I would just say congressional reform. Uh, I, I think that that would completely need to change. Um, so first, you have to make Term sure. Term limits, please. Yes, uh, a long a long list of things that I think, if if uh, you know, if completed, would solve all the country's problems. Uh, Term limits, more people in Congress, um, big big pay cuts for people in Congress. You have to make the job not appealing to someone who seeks to have an appealing job. You have to have this be a job that only people who truly want to help other people uh, would, would go after. Um, and of course you have to make sure that corporations and, and individuals can't buy seats in office, essentially. And I, I think once you do that, everything else just just will, will come naturally and will happen on its own. It'll, it'll trickle down in some kind of way. Uh, we actually might see something trickle down for the first time ever. Yeah. All right, we're down to the last 10 minutes. Dennis, let's see the next question. Brian, what's the next big thing for the show? You expanded to HD and five days this year. Anything else in the works? The return of the live stream. So let, let's address the live stream, if we may, Lewis, because I think this, for, for five to 10 people, maybe 20, 25 people, has been a big sticking point. Up until, I don't know, at this point, a year and four months ago or something like that, we would do a live stream of the program at 2 p.m. Eastern time each day. Um, we stopped doing the live stream when we did the high definition upgrades and when we, uh, and it continued when we moved to New York City and Austin, Texas. Right now, to do the live stream with the technical setup that we have, we would need a very expensive piece of equipment called a high definition TriCaster, okay? And at this point, I don't think that, I think, I don't want to fatigue the audience with another fundraiser, Lewis, because that could be, even if we were to go used and not the, not brand, not the latest model, but the previous one, we could still be looking at, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for that piece of equipment, plus you never know, there could be other codecs and things that have to come up. And it's really just a numbers thing. We were only having about three hundred people on the live stream. So not that we didn't care about those 300 people, but the podcast, now that we're able to get the podcast up a couple hours earlier, in part because we're not doing the live stream, within 15 minutes of uploading already has those 300 downloads. So it was really just a weighing the options thing. How can we get the show to more people earlier in the day? And, and the, the live stream just didn't really fit into that. Uh, also, because of how the program is produced, Lewis, the live, we would need to juggle several things to get the live stream back up and running. So I'm not against doing it. It was fun to do it. It was great to have a live chat commentary of what was going on on the show. But for technical reasons right now and, and being aware that we don't really want to do another fundraiser right now, we just did one in January and we did two during the previous year, it doesn't seem like it's the, like, like it's the perfect storm that's going to get us the live stream back right now. And that's all the, the technical stuff. Personally, I never wanted to do a live stream. I don't like doing a live stream. I don't like live anything. I, I like being in control of the production. Uh, and I, I, <laughs> that, just, that doesn't happen when you're doing a live stream, unfortunately. I know people like it. I don't like it. And I, I think our program is better not doing a live stream. Uh, but in terms of... I, I think there is no question at all. Oh, I'm sorry, I talked about, let me just, I, I, there is no question at all that the program is technically better when we are not doing a live stream because of the limited staff that we have. There's no question about that. All right, yeah. And I mean, what else do I see happening in the future of the show? I don't really know. Uh, we've achieved all our short-term goals. I guess I would like to see us uh, jump into different forms of, of, of content, of delivering content. And uh, that's um, a whole other realm. I don't know. The, the possibilities oh, are yeah. endless. No question about it. And, and we've achieved the short-term goals that we've kind of explicitly discussed, but I have a long wish list of stuff. I mean, for example, we could be, um, we could be putting the channel 
on several additional platforms if we were to, for example, have um, a, an $8,000 encoder, right? A very specific encoder that would allow us to do some certain things with video that would deliver to some uh, uh, new platforms. We would be able to produce significant additional content if we were able to hire an additional person, right? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that if we had the resources, we could be doing. So, so there's a very long list, but certainly of the immediate goals that we've announced to the audience, Lewis, before I just announced some others, which are kind of uh, in the distance right now, we have been able to do most of them, which I think is really great. Oh, yeah. And, and we're, we're both very happy with it, and we hope you guys are too. All right, we've got five minutes left. Let's see if we can squeeze in a, a few more questions here. Dennis, uh, whatever you have next, we're ready for. John Greenlee, would you consider book reviews on the bonus show in addition to Lewis's beer reviews? Just read A Gun for Sale. David recommended on the, on the show. Great book. Well, we're still do I First of all, Lewis has made it very, very clear that reading fiction is by no means his thing. And I won't put words in his mouth. He can restate that if he wants in a second. Um, I, I still do my Thursday reviews. And sometimes it's a documentary, sometimes it is a book, but I'll keep in mind it, it sometimes the book reviews actually do better than the than the documentary reviews. And sometimes we do get comments like people saying, Why are you talking about this, David? Do people still read? But those antagonists aside, yeah, I would I I'm reading all the time and I would love to do more book reviews. We'll see, Lewis. I mean maybe maybe working them in on the bonus show is an idea. I think you would have more time to go to Time to go into more detail on the bonus show. Uh, I reading is not really my thing. Certainly, there are books that I've read that I've enjoyed. It's just not something I do. Um, and if David feels really strongly about something that he wants to go into more detail about on the bonus show, by all means, uh, let's uh, let's do it. All right, Dennis. Let's go to the next question. If we get money out of politics, Blake wants to know what should progressives focus on next. Uh, the economic system, uh, no question about it. I mean, we have a we have an economic system right now uh, that even taking out the, the political corruption that goes on uh, has completely created an unsustainable situation for many workers. We just talked about a woman who died sleeping in her car between two of her four jobs. Um, we need absolutely to work on the increased economic inequality that we have. We also need to work on people who are in the U.S. who are 25 to 30 percent by some reports of, of uh, grocery store food is thrown out. Um, people who, who don't have enough to eat, right? I mean, that, that to me is just a huge moral problem. And in general, the, pro the problem of, of poverty in the United States and around the world, but just thinking for now about the United States and kind of progressives working domestically, it's, it's completely insane that there are people who, who don't have enough to eat, and there are many of them in this country, when we have such an abundance of resources that are completely unoptimized in terms of their distribution. That, to me, has to be addressed in a serious way. I would also add energy to, to that, because if you think about it in the long term, uh, that needs to completely fundamentally change. And if it doesn't, uh, you're, you're dead in the water. Uh, that would be a huge one. We could be, if progressives took over, and uh, in a perfect world, we could be the ones who paved the way in, in that realm. All right, let's go, go to maybe one or two more, depending on timing. Dennis, let's give us the uh, next question. We have Srinath back. Srinath, question number two, fire away, limited time. Hmm. Okay, hold on. Let me. Let me. I'm sorry, Srinath. I think your volume was down from before. Let's. You can start the question over. We didn't hear it. Okay. Do you think Elizabeth Warren will reconsider not running for president and have a lot of power as president to outwit the establishment? Okay. Very good question to go out on here. Um, I. I don't think that Elizabeth Warren is is going to run. I just don't think it's going to happen. I'm not saying that that's my desire. I'm not saying that I don't think she would be a good choice. I just, thinking of what I think will happen, I don't think it's going to happen. And I can't ignore that even if Elizabeth Warren might be one of the most liberal presidents that this country uh, uh, may have had, may, may have in a long time if, if she were to be elected, we cannot assume, as we saw with President Obama Lewis, 
that any liberal notion presented by Elizabeth Warren, the candidate, would be carried out if Elizabeth Warren were to be elected president in this hypothetical world, because there are just some things that the president has to conform to when it comes to the, the, uh, the realities, the empirical realities of that office and the other parties that have influence over you. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and by parties we don't just mean uh, Republican Party, Tea Party, that type of party. I mean everything, the corporations as well. I think Obama was a bit naive when he made a lot of those promises when he took office, and I think he kind of hit a wall. I think maybe got blindsided a little bit, and I think the same thing would happen to anyone who has really big plans and wants to really shake things up. It's, it's certainly never going to happen overnight. Uh, will Hillary pick her as a running mate, maybe? I really doubt that, too. She kind of have to pick uh, a man, I think, unfortunately, if, if she wants a chance at the presidency. All right, and on that note, it is 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 8 p.m. Central, where Lewis is, and we will call that the end of the second David Packman Show member town hall. Thanks to everybody who participated. We are going to try to put a recording up of this entire thing on YouTube like we did last time. It depends on how that went on Lewis's end. Lewis, don't spoil it for us now. Let's uh, wait and see. Fingers crossed. Uh, so thanks to everybody, and we will talk to you tomorrow. We do have a new show coming up in what feels like only a few hours, Lewis, even though it is going to be uh, tomorrow afternoon. So, Lewis, anything you want to add? Nope. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and hopefully we can do this again soon. All right, and thanks, of course, to Dennis, the intern, for facilitating and doing an excellent job keeping the questions coming. We will talk to everybody really soon.